Here we go. Okay. Okay. Present okay. Thank you, sir. Presenting. Okay. And let me just get give the title and my name. Presenting different time steps at the start of inflation using Kuiper density matrix for the use of the platon in determining different conceivable time intervals for time flow analysis and gravitational weight. Andrew Beckwith, Physics Department, Chongqing University, Department of Physics, People's Republic of China, R. Will 9955B, a Gmail, not Gmail, gmail.com. Thank you. Now, next, abstract. We are using the book toward quantum gravity is an article by Klaus Kuiper as to a quantum gravity interpretation of density matrix in the early universe. The density matrix we are using is a one loop approximation with an unflattened value in potential terms like B5 using the Patamadon value that we can expect that the scale factor is A times initial times uh, a T to the gamma from early times. In doing so, we isolate out presuming an exceedingly small initial time step candidates, initial time step values, which are from polynomial for time values use a Kuiper density value. A gravity wave analysis concludes our article with a flat on decay. Minimum scale factor, cosmological constant, space time bubble, as you want to talk about, don't, go, don't pay so much attention to that. Introduction, our initial goal is to attain by a Kuiper density function function candidate minimum time shift, which will be for the purpose of giving inputs into an uncertain principle of the form, delta E, delta T, approximately four H bar. Where the candidate for density matrix uses, and this is actually a, 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 a sub simplification from Padamadon, H squared, B naught, and here's that big polynomial expression, you don't have to say, you know, constant, you know, with some sort of proportional of T, one half uh, B uh, pi G minus four. That's what I worked out. A T scale factor, A initial T gamma. So the gamma, I mean, the, the inflaton logarithm, and that's a standard uh, procedure done by Patamadon. And so then what I said is that how could you get H h squared over five dot is proportional to 10 to the minus uh, five. And doing all this, we are making use of the following uh, from four due to a one loop approximation. Now this is again from Kuiper. Here's the equation four, all right? Which after we interpolate at delta t makes use of equation one, which is derived as given. And this is what you might call essentially deformed, uh, this is what you might call essentially deformed quantum mechanics and other things of the sort. And this is actually from a Margulis uh, derivation. You can see it in the, uh, okay. Now, we will be applying equation four to a term delta T and from this step applying equation one to foundation import in issues of time flow at the beginning. So, we have this delta E expression right over here. And we say something like that. And, okay, understand the import of equation two, equation three, and equation four for delta T. Now, let me go to equation two. Okay, equation two, equation three, and equation four. All right, and this and this especially equation four is from, from Kuiper's book is a density functional argument. All right, so then what I said, our assumption is that time t, which comes delta t is extremely small. Without generality, we said uh, z is equal to two. And I picked a value for that, you know, for the Greek uh, symbol, Greek pi over two. And then what I was able to come up with was a minimum time step which is delta T, which is four times this ex massive expression with the potential. But here's the interesting part. You have one minus four gamma exponential plus or minus three eighth NP four over B naught. That is the core of my argument right there. You see it? That's what I was doing. All right, now. Interpreting equation nine in terms of how it is affects on equation one. 
we have to consider what uh, this symbol may or may not be. The core of the derivation equation for is due to depend on the following, which is the quantum uh, gravitational scale of, inf of inflation is calculated by finding the sharp probability peak and the distribution function of chaotic and inflationary cosmologies driven by a scalar field with large negative constant of uh, non-minimal uh, interaction. In the case of a no boundary state of the universe, this peak corresponds to the ex external infl inflation, while for the tunneling quantum state, it generates a standard inflation or scenario. The subplanctian parameters of this peak, the mean value of the corresponding h by my, uh, minus five and p as quantum width and other things of the sort, are found to be in good correspondence with the observational status of, inflash, of, in, in, uh, of inflation theory, end of quote. This is the use of equation 3.47 so that we can have a restriction, as I said, delta AB. This is very important because of the fact is that what I'm saying is that certain issues of that density functional and other things sort can tell us something what would be a preferred delta T initial time step, which is eluded analysis, which has been eluding analysis for quite a long time. All right, now let me get to my other point right over here. Notice here, this is akin to making use of equation 3.7. So we have restrictions on particle manufacturing for the theory. This is line with delta E. The consequence of frequency is, is, is frequency of signals is fault. First, we make an estimation at the width of the wave front of a de Broglie wave, which may be a consequence of a signal, as well as the position of the phenomenon of generation of, say, gravitons, in which we refer to the following as motivation or the linkages of graviton mass and other things for heavy gravity. And eight, we have the following, which is I give a, this is something in, this is a relative value. The inflaton mass is 2.746356 times the Planck mass. And this is the starting value of inflaton mass, let's say at T is 3.9776 uh, Planck times. Having this value that should be uh, compared with the value of energy density, and I get that density right over here. And uh, well, this is the way of attaining the following is density, and this is using uh, these uh, so-called uh, Planck, you know, scaled units. And so I just give that right over here. What is the point? All right, the point is is that. Okay, this is a probability density function, and this is what's referred to in Kuiper, and so I, I give the derivation of it. In quantum mechanics, a probability amplitude is a complex number in describing the behavior system. The modulus squared of this quantity represents a probability density. Note in the interpretation of values of a wave function as a probability amplitude is a pillar of the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics. We are reproducing the idea that the the problem the following is true okay that has to do is we're going essentially to copenhagen and where this other thing to the sort is that this will allow you perhaps to come up with a scaling procedure for the mass of a graviton or things of the sort and that goes into and then what i said right over here what i'm referring to is an argument that was done by uh that was done by Karen Fries as far as the breakup, where you might be able to see some of the sort of things, so you might have a phenomena, a breakup of, of initial black holes. And this is her criteria. MP4, and you have that N4 value, and that N4 value right over here, right over here is what I was uh, referring to right here, this M squared M. Now, which is, is that the point of it is, outside from other things, is that you would have that N4, which you would determine, would say where you might have a breakup of initial primordial black holes. They share a, they share a part in, uh, initially, and they may generate particles and contribute to the inflaton. And this is Karen Fries, and it said, this is the mechanism of the breaking up initially of black holes due to falling criteria right over here. 
And if you break up initial uh, set of small uh, primordial black holes, you might generate some things that would affect the CMBR. All right. Now, which is, is that there's more to it. There's more to it, but I want to go straight to the conclusion. All right. All right. Now, which is, is that in terms of gravitational waves or gravity that might be determined by the breakup uh, by the breakup function, which is what right over here. This is a, a density for breaking up of uh, primordial black holes, is that you might be able to get, which I put in, a discussion of uh, the frequency range for the breakup of black holes and release of black holes could be initially as high as 10 to 27 gigahertz. Let's say at the beginning, you redshift that down so it's going to get 10 to uh, 27. It might get to something that's something like a, and it's just a few hertz range when you have all the redshifting. But that's where it could come from. Keep in mind the inflaton is given is over two times Planck mass, which is by reference 27 more than that to ensure that there's a gravitational wave signal from inflaton theory is generated by the procedures given in 27. The E-fold values could be as low as 50-fold. Uh, and we are considering a signal that might be created. And let me just refer to some of the references that, that I'm getting out of here, all right? This is shat moreland deformed density matrix and quantum entropy of black hole entropy. And this is uh, right up here, the density matrix formulation. Here is the workhorse, which I use as Klaus Kuiper, right over here. This is Klaus Kuiper, quantum cosmology, called quantum gravity, lecture notes in physics. And there's a lot more, which I put in. And let me just get to, the okay so the one of the things which i was using is reference 27 which is scotastic gravitational waves from particle origin or something like that where might the particle origins come from well the particle origins might come from what you might call the scaling of the mass m which would show up let me go back to it again so that everyone sees it right here this is a critical density, which you would get to say for uh, Planck sized black holes that would be breaking up. And this is Karen Freeze. This is the N4, which I uh, came up with, and other things of the sort. And which is, is that what I did in the calculation is to essentially give some sort of substance to what is in reference 27. Kazunori Naka, Nakayama and Tong Yang, uh, scotastic gravitation waves from particle origin, physical letter B, uh, 788, 2019, 341 to 346, that's the archive. And of course, the question of how much and how much uh, uh, you're going to have in terms of uh, E folds. Well, it's been going for 50 to 60, or it may be something else. So with that, which is, is that what I'm saying, ladies and gentlemen, who you are listening to in the situation, is that you do have a PDF on my talk. I misspelled my, uh, it is rwill 9955 b at gmail, not gmai.com. I welcome you asking me questions. Um, I'm going to have to prepare for my next talk. Is this is this satisfactory, at least as a start? Yes. Thank you very much for your talk. Can you hear me? Yeah, well, I better get ready for the next one because I'm going to get my uh, butt kicked as I don't. OK, this, uh, we, 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 we can't uh, <clears throat> ask questions yet. Huh? We'll ask one or two questions, then i got to get out of here. OK, uh, I have one question, OK? Well, I have that a big question for you. Yes, uh, for uh, uh, you mentioned in your talk uh, the, uh, that the time could be quantized. Yes. And uh, what is the smallest time step in in terms of the, the smallest time? time step? Would just be perhaps something like about just a a uh, 
it would come out to be something like about uh, 1.1 plank uh, plank time step, and the larger one might be something like about uh, six times larger. So you might okay. have two different time steps that might exist. Yes. And it has to do with the setting of initial parameters in the cosmology. It's very, mm -hmm. very sensitive to initial conditions. Okay. Yeah, because I, I mentioned, I, I asked this question because there are uh, many Well, it was people absolutely look. fundamental. Yeah, it's very fundamental. And uh, okay, thank you again. And um, so you go to your next talk now? Yeah, I just want to say, I just had to get over this uh, get out of Dodge, but I want to say thank you so much. Okay, yeah. Okay, I better, uh, yeah, it's time for me to go. I, I had 15 minutes. I better get ready yeah, for the yeah. next one. Yeah, we have still five minutes and then I, st I start talking. Okay, thank you uh, once again, Andrew. See you. I just I want to say thank you very much. Yeah, I will send you an email about uh, the, the mutual uh, uh, cooperation. No okay. problem. No problem. I really want to see anything because I'm sick and tired of all the bullshit in terms of uh, dark matter. I'm sick and tired of it. <laughs> yeah, okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right. Can you close your, yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm going to close it. Um, All right. I'll... Well, I will start my screen one minute. Um... <laughs> Share screen. Can you see uh, Angelo my screen? Yes, I can. And uh, Bodo, hello. Hello, Bodo. Okay, I will start my talk. Can you hear? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, I will start my talk about a new black hole solution in conformal dilaton gravity. Uh, you can read it back on my uh, homepage for details. I will not show all the, the, the sheets because that is too much. Well, um, my overview, I will uh, short uh, presentate the conformal dilaton gravity model, the possible route to quantum gravity, uh, then the new black hole solution and uh, the summary. Uh, I followed the approach of Hoft by writing the space-time uh, by a dilaton field times an uh, unphysical space-time. And uh, we shall see what it uh, will bring us uh, when applied to an uh, embarked five-dimensional space-time. Uh, great success of the standard model. Everybody knows uh, how the model uh, looks like, the Lagrangian of the standard model. <clears throat> Gauge sector, uh, the scalar field, and the, uh, <clears throat> the Maxon head potential. And the spontaneous uh, breaking of the gauge symmetry. Well, at high temperature, we have here uh, the minimum, and when temperature drops, we know that this is the real vacuum and not the, uh, the fate uh, 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 minimum here at the top. And uh, the question is why not apply the, the symmetry breaking? at uh, gravity by an idea of uh, Professor Hoft. Well, what are the problems at high energy? Uh, if one likes to describe the black hole spacetime, then you run into problems when you try to uh, describe quantum effects near the horizon. And uh, many physicists conjecture that the clue will be found by uh, a description of the radiation effects near the horizon. We have the complementarity uh, from the ingoing and outset of servers, of servers uh, the back reaction and uh, how to restore unitarity and locality. In fact, there are two mainstreams. Uh, Malda Sene will talk this afternoon about his model and at Hoft also uh, this afternoon about uh, a new boundary condition and the antipodal mapping in order to describe the Hawking radiation. Well, uh, I will follow the, the approach of Hoft and um, well, the, the way out 
possible way out are the antipodal mapping as a new boundary condition between the, the, the Penrose diagrams uh, one and two, uh, as we shall see. And um, the, the, the basic is that points on the horizon are antipodal. So in fact, there is no inside of the black hole. And um, the connection uh, between the in and out coin of surface is a one-to-one map that is fundamental. Uh, no firewalls are needed in this model, and, uh, and the identification is metric under CPT. We, uh, I will consider here the, uh, the spinning black hole and uh, in Kruska coordinates, and uh, this is the antipodal map. Uh, this is the Kruska coordinates, and we change this um, for the time dependent situation. Uh, what is the basic of the uh, conformal dilaton? We write, one writes the, uh, the metric in this way. This is the dilaton, this is the unphysical space time. Uh, and the dilaton uh, uh, is, uh, can be treated in this, on the scale, uh, same uh, scale as the, uh, the scalar field, or the same footing as the scalar field. This is the action. You see here the scalar field, this is the dilaton. And, uh, Normally it has the wrong side, but we change to a complex, uh, we shift to the complex uh, value, and then it is just a scalar field. This Lagrangian is invariant under the conformal transformation. You can easily check it by this and n is the dimension. And uh, you see in, 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 in NS4, we have the omega square, and uh, we will consider uh, five dimensional, then it, it starts with uh, uh, omega to the power four over three. This is the transformation of the scalar field and this is the Lipton field. Note that we make the covariant derivative with respect to the um, tilde space time. Then we say that the infalling and the outside observers use different ways to fix the conformal calc gauge. And we shall see that we can calculate this in my model. We consider the vacuum situation for the time being. Uh, some notes. In general, one conjectures that conformal it is an exact symmetry and it is uh, spontaneously broken. The effective action stays locally a conformal effect after the omega integration uh, when, when you uh, try to do uh, quantum mechanical calculations. Um, we are dealing with a non flat. Space central that makes uh, things very complicated. Uh, by adding a mass term, then uh, the, the conformal invariance will be broken, of course, and uh, of course it spoils the traces of the energy momentum test. Um, in context of the uh, of the uh, quantum mechanical uh, calculations, by shifting to the complex to the old scala and uh, Dilaton field are treated on the equal footing. I mentioned before. Um, only omega and meta fields are described by renormalizable locations. And uh, when the tilde G minu is flat, yeah, that is no problem, but get renormalized when you, uh, uh, that is, get, uh, is renormalized, then you go to lower times, uh, lower scales, energy scales. Um, what happens when you, uh, you switch to a five dimensional wire space time? Uh, the most severe problem is what is going on at high energy and how to construct an effective field theory without an ultraviolet cutoff. So we have two options of you, you maintain unitarity or you maintain a renormalizability. Uh, one needs gauge fixing terms, that they have pop of course, and uh, extrapolation from which we classical cosmos can run to problems, uh, nice articles about Mannheim, the dark energy and uh, singularities. And uh, if you try to do an expansion, so an approximation scheme uh, offers no relief because at high curvature, the approximation is not, is not valid, of course. Uh, can we uh, solve some problem? Yes. Consider now the randall sundrum model. Uh, so we write the five-dimensional space-time. This is the, uh, the unphysical. as a four-dimension plus uh, this term, and n is the, the unit normal on the brain. And then we write the four-dimensional uh, unphysical space-time, again, as an omega squared bar omega uh, times this space-time. So we, in fact, we have a five-dimensional omega and a four-dimensional. 
Um, <clears throat> then the renormalized counterterms in an uh, eventual constructed effective field theory will cause unitarity problems only in the bulk at the large action. So you solve the, the problem of the UV cutoff. Uh, in the five dimensional Randall Sandra model, we have the space time, and this is called the wow factor, but uh, we shall see this becomes the uh, omega term. Um, the four dimensional Planck scale. Uh, is no longer the fundamental scale in the bar of space times. Uh, it becomes an effective uh, scale, which can be of the order of the uh, uh, TFV scale. scale. Well, um, the bar factor, you can uh, read it back later. It, 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 it uh, causes then a finite contribution to the five, five dimensional uh, volume in this way. So, uh, but moreover, a byproduct of the randall sandra model is the hierarchy problem could be solved. And that is also a nice side effect. Well, our model, this is the five dimensional Einstein equations. We work in an empty bulk. So this term is uh, self, uh, will be taken zero. So we have only uh, the uh, negative bulk tension in the five dimensional uh, Einstein equations. Uh, we write, uh, uh, the, the five dimensional space time this way. And this is the, um, the line elements dependent of X and the extra dimension uh, Y. Uh, gamma will be taken one uh, for the time being. Then we have the four dimensional, the effective uh, four dimensional Einstein equation. You can read it back in, in many articles. Uh, these terms are zero, of course, because we consider no bulk contribution. So our uh, four-dimensional effective Einstein equation contains only the contribution from the uh, wild tensor, the projected wild tensor on the brain. It carries information of the gravitation field outside the brain. So what is uh, happening then? This is our space-time. We consider an, uh, a black hole space-time. Uh, this is the conventional uh, form. Um, and uh, we work in uh, polar coordinates. This is the uh, non diagonal element. So it's an, uh, a spinning black hole. And um, this is the, uh, the uh, dilaton field to the power of four over three because we work in five dimensions. We write the omega as a product as uh, omega one and omega two. And then it turns out that omega two from the five dimensional Einstein equation, that is just a constant. So the, uh, this contribution is a constant and the, 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 we call it the length scale of the extra dimension. Well, what are the, uh, what are the uh, field equations? Omega time derivative N and N phi. And what is now uh, interesting, we get an exact solution. Omega is in this form and the N is, uh, can be written in this form to an, an expression in uh, an r to the power five divided by r square. So when d1 is zero, we have an to the power three and uh, n phi can be written independent of the other one. You see here the uh, uh, omega square in the denominator. Um, now we write uh, the, this, uh, this equation and um, you can write it in um, the vacuum model. Yeah, here you see uh, this was just in the five dimensional. Now we start with the uh, for the, the the effective field equation. You see here the effective field equations. Uh, you see again uh, an energy momentum test because this is the the term from the uh, conformal invariant uh, uh, expression of the action, and this is the uh, the wild tensor projection. Again, we get a set of equations, and what is now very curious, you, we get the solution of omega bar uh, in this way, and here we see omega to the power three over two. That is consistent because the contribution is uh, to the power, uh, omega to the power four over three. So you get here also the omega uh, this expression uh, to the power two. And n is exactly the same form, apart from the uh, coefficients. So the n solution 
is a shame for the Africa field because and the, the uh, contribution from N5 is only the difference is only the, the omega bar to the power three instead of two. Well, there's a singularity and time singularity, and uh, you see here the N are the same. But we can plot N to, in order to obtain the uh, the uh, the horizons. You see, you can have uh, one, two. Or zero. Zero, uh, this is and one, and the, this is two horizons. Yeah? Uh, only for C is one, and has, C, uh, if you choose C1, uh, the constant in the uh, expression here, this C1, if it's zero, we get uh, only one real solution. R is 1.6, B2, and B2 is constant here in the uh, solution. Uh, you can write it in in dimension n, and that is curious, n is four or five, you can write a solution, uh, uh, here you see n, uh, this is independent of uh, the dimension four or five, and you see also for n is three and n is two, it is uh, not defined, so it's only for four or five. So you can write it in general n. Uh, if you omit the contribution from the bulk, you get this expression, and uh, for D1 is zero, we have only naked singularity. So that, mean, that means that when you consider the five dimensional of large space time, we get at least one real horizon. Um, <clears throat> then we should like to draw the Penrose diagram. So we need null coordinates in order to describe the Hawking radiation. And uh, <clears throat> some notes about this construction. The created part is from a thermal spectrum by surface gravity, and we have the formula for the mass loss. loss. Uh, uh, you can read it in the book of what. And um, K is the surface gravity. Uh, this is the anchor momentum. And um, it turns out in my solution, we, uh, note we have exact solutions for N phi and N and omega. It blows up uh, at the horizon as T to the power three. So that is also uh, uh, can be used to, to describe the, uh, the, 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 the uh, evaporation of the black hole. It goes to a power of T. Uh, note that it, this G is still unphysical. So it is an, and you can see it is a BTZ-like spacetime. Uh, and BTZ spacetime black hole uh, solution is when you uh, go to three dimensions. And uh, But in our model, it is not suitable because when you omit, we get not uh, the correct uh, uh, results. Now we change the coordinates. We go to uh, R star and T star, and we obtain the expression for the uh, new uh, coordinates. And our space time can be written is this way. You see here uh, a factor in front of the new uh, two dimensional element. And it turns out that you must take a sum over the roots of the expression of n in the uh, in the no uh, denominator and uh, this and and the, the the roots of this expression this is only one root uh, you can see and uh, this has in general uh, if c1 is zero it has uh, three roots but only one real root and this is the the you can uh, define a new uh, uh, far c variable and then we go over to uh, u plus and u minus for r larger than the horizon. So we, we consider here only one uh, horizon for the time being. And we have here the new coordinates. These are the null coordinates, null uh, describing for the outgoing and ingoing null uh, uh, curves. And um, then we make the, the Penrose compactification in this uh, way, uh, as usual to do. And then we have uh, uh, at the end this expression for the uh, line element. And how you can have express in this, in this, this uh, formula. We can solve R and T for the moment, huh? one horizon, and we get this expression for the R. So we can draw the Penrose diagram. This is alpha beta, it depends on the horizon and uh, factor. So it, it is, this remain real. Uh, uh, and, and, and uh, regular for a B2 positive and B3 positive. Huh? So uh, the, the, the bar 
metric is regular and conformally flat. So it can be used to locate the light cone. And it is singular free. And the scale term is also uh, uh, will not do any harm. This 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 the age. This is the uh, the factor before the uh, the two dimensional uh, line element. This is the Penrose diagram, and here you see that it is regular everywhere, and, and no error error zero is removed. And this is the uh, antipodal map. This is when you approach R from outside, and this is when you approach the horizon from uh, inside. This is an R inside. So in fact, there is no inside of the black hole. Uh, that is the idea of uh, Professor Hoofs also. He wrote a lot of articles about this model. Uh, well, the dilaton field, we must, what, what, what is now the, the, the use of, of, of the, the result of the, oh, this is the expression of the combined omega uh, from the five dimensional and four dimensional contribution. And this is this expression. And <clears throat> one identifies this uh, in the antipodal map. <clears throat> and the question is that we should like <clears throat> to describe what the infalling observers and the outside observer uh, uh, will notice about the omega. And we will use now this transformation and uh, the idea is that the two observers will experience a different uh, omega, large omega. You can do it by uh, considering the, uh, the, the, the surface cavity and to, to define an, a conformal invariant uh, killing factor. Well, I have a few minutes, so I will skip this and I will uh, describe shortly how to construct a, a, a conformal invariant model. Uh, this is, these are two uh, normals. We can divide because we have now an exact expression of these uh, n and n phi. We can uh, do the construction, and the uh, surface gravity can be expressed in this way. And um, this term must be zero, and we get an expression and an extra constraint on the time derived of, of n phi. But uh, here you see, when you uh, try to make the uh, the, the surface gravity conform invariant, we get this expression for the uh, gauge freedom, right? the conformal uh, freedom. And the question is, could this be used for the outside observer? And for the inside observer, we, could, uh, we can write another expression because to make uh, the uh, construction conformal killing factor and then de-derive it. So uh, we have uh, now a complete uh, description of the uh, the new black hole solution and also what uh, what eventually the infalling and the outside of soft will, uh, will uh, experience. Okay, that is my summary. Are there questions? Okay, uh, then the next speaker. That is uh, Yarul. Are you there? Yarul? Yarul? Bodo? Hello? Yes, hello. Um, Do you understand? Uh, hello, Parul, are you there? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Just, just two minutes. Give me two minutes, sir. Okay. And Hello. after, yes, after, I see also yes. that Angelo ah, is also present that and unbuddy. Angelo is present and unbuddy. Yes, I'm here. Yes. Okay, Angelo is there. Okay, Angelo is there. 
So we are waiting for uh, so we are waiting for uh, Haru. Uh, yes, sir. I'm ready. Shall I share my screen? Yes, yeah, share your screen, please. Yes, share your screen, please. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. So is is that fine? The view is okay. Yes. We see your presentation. Yes. Okay. We see uh, your presentation. Okay. Uh, okay. So actually, I, I uh, my bandwidth. Okay, so my bandwidth is a problem. So I'll uh, I will switch off my video. Only my audio will be on. The internet is not good, unfortunately. I hope that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, you so, can start. Uh, thank you very much uh, for giving. Okay, you can start. Okay. Uh, so thank you very much for giving me this chance to talk at the sixteenth uh, Marcel Grossman meeting. So my talk is uh, about the relationship between zero modes and uh, entanglement. So previously in the literature, it has been uh, known that in the zero mode limit for the ground state entanglement, uh, the divergent term scales as log or is double log. Now, we had this question on our mind that uh, why the divergent term shows two different kinds of uh, scaling uh, behavior, either log or double log. Uh, universally, it is accepted as log. So uh, we wanted to ask this question, uh, rather answer this question, if there's a physical interpretation behind it, and we worked on it. And uh, we saw uh, that these two different divergent behaviors can be taken as the uh, signatures of the crossover. So uh, this talk is based uh, primarily on this, that how these two different divergent behaviors can be seen as signatures of the crossover in the zero mode limit for the ground state entanglement. And the reference I've already given here. So the plan of the talk is, uh, initially I'll talk a bit about the entanglement entropy and zero mode. Then I will talk a bit about the log nature of the zero mode divergence, then the double log nature of the zero mode divergence. And finally, how these two different divergent behaviors can be seen as a signature of a crossover. So I'll start off with the entanglement entropy uh, part. So uh, primarily for that, we consider a bipartite state having a subsystem A and B, so that the total Hilbert space can be written as a tensorial product of HA and HB. So where uh, HA belongs to subsystem A and HB belongs to subsystem B. And then we take the trace over the degrees of freedom pertaining to the subsystem B, which results in the reduced density matrix rho A. Next, the entanglement entropy can be calculated by the von Neumann formula uh, which is given in the following equation, trace rho A, L, and rho A, uh, also called as the von Neumann entropy. Now, this entanglement entropy gives us the measure of entanglement between pure states. I specifically mentioned this because there are other measures when it comes to mixed states. So just to be uh, sure about that, it, it will only give a measure of entanglement for the pure states. Next, I'll talk about the zero modes. So for our purpose, we will consider the discretized version of one plus one dimensional mass of scalar field, which means we are dealing with a chain of harmonic oscillators. So once we get the Hamiltonian for this uh, harmonic oscillator chain, uh, we can diagonalize the potential or the coupling matrix for this harmonic oscillator chain. And the resulting eigenvalues after this diagonalization, they are called as the normal modes for the system. Now, when these normal modes, they pick up the zero value, we say that we have zero mode. So technically, we'll be analyzing the system in these uh, zero mode limits. Now I'll talk about the log nature of the zero mode divergence. So for this purpose, uh, we begin with the Hamiltonian for a massive scalar field in one plus one dimensions as given an equation one. And then we will discretize this, we'll put it on a lattice. So uh, that means now we have a chain of harmonic uh, oscillators where A uh, is a UV cutoff, and we also have an IR cutoff where uh, the length is related to uh, the total number of oscillators plus one uh, times the UV cutoff. Now, upon discretization, the Hamiltonian is of the form as given by equation two, where lambda is A square, M square, M is the mass. So uh, people saw that for the case of the Dirichlet boundary condition and for the case of the Norman boundary condition, the form of the divergent contribution in the zero mode limit, which had previously mentioned for the ground state entanglement, 
that the scaling goes as log, as I've shown in equation three. So this was about the log nature of the zero mode divergence. On the other hand, uh, again, uh, we, we uh, take the discretized version of the massive scalar field, and then people analyzed uh, the zero mode limit uh, divergence for the periodic boundary condition, they saw that it can also scale as double log as given in equation five, where delta is the IR cutoff. So we see that uh, for the discretized version of one plus one massive scale of field, we can have both forms of the divergences in the zero mode limit log and the double log. Okay. So as I was uh, already stated that uh, we see these two forms of the divergent page, log and double log. So we raise this question that, is there a physical interpretation behind these two different forms of the zero mode divergence? Why are we seeing two different natures of divergent uh, behavior? Usually it is uh, log, standard ones. So uh, we wanted to answer this question. And in order to answer this question, uh, we first uh, analyze the entanglement spectrum now, the entanglement spectrum is uh, defined by equation six, okay, where it is the negative of the log of the reduced uh, density matrix. So we did some numerical calculation, which is shown in the figures here, A and B. And uh, DBC stands for the Dishley boundary condition, NBC stands for the Norman boundary conditions. So we saw that in the zero mode limit, the, the nearby levels, they come close to each other. So we see that this blue and red line in both the graphs, they start converging, they start approaching each other as lambda tends to zero. Now, lambda tends to zero pertains to the zero mode limit here. So <clears throat> this was one very neat observation then. The next uh, uh, look at what we call is entanglement gap. Again, this is a, a numerical uh, part of a paper. So uh, this entanglement gap is the gap between the largest eigenvalue corresponding to n equal to zero and the smallest eigenvalue corresponding to n equal to one. Again, we did some numerical computation for Dishley and Norman, even in the figures. And we saw that the entanglement gap closes in the zero mode limit, okay? So uh, the, the behavior of this entanglement spectrum and the entanglement gap, uh, when the gap closes and in case of the spectrum, the levels are coming close to each other, that means we are getting some signatures of a crossover in the zero mode limit. Okay, so now we already had some numerical uh, uh, results at hand. We wanted to treat this crossover in an analytical fashion. Uh, so what we realized is in the zero mode limit, we already uh, we were aware that we have divergent contributions towards entanglement entropy. So what uh, we thought, why not to analyze the leading order divergent uh, term in the zero mode limit to probe this crossover. So now we will try to probe this uh, crossover uh, via some analytical uh, pathway. Okay. So in order to do so, we, can, so we will consider the low line normal modes. Okay. In a system of uh, two n oscillators. And uh, further, we take into account this data, which gives us the relative spacing of the lowest two normal modes with respect to the rescale mass lambda. So for the digital boundary condition, uh, this zeta can be given uh, by equation seven or alternatively one can use some other set of parameters and uh, that results in equation eight. Accordingly for the Norman boundary condition this is given by equation nine and we see that the zeta for DBC is three times uh, that of NBC. So for the purpose of uh, our uh, calculations, we will consider two limits of zeta because there will be different behaviors for the entanglement entropy in these two different limits. The first is zeta tending to much less than one, uh, which implies this small relative level spacing. On the other hand, uh, this also corresponds to the case when A tending to zero or mass tending to zero, that limit goes slower than N tending to infinity. So there's a comparison of speed here. And uh, this set of limit A tending to zero and mass tending to zero is also equivalent to the limit L tending to infinity. This is uh, zeta much less than one. The other limit that we considered was zeta much greater than one, which corresponds to large relative level spacing. And in terms of the limits, 
uh, here the A or the mass tending to zero will go faster than n tending to infinity. And on the other hand, this former limit will be equal to L tending to zero. So uh, the contrast is in one case, the speed is slower and the other case, the speed is faster. In one case, L tends to infinity, the other case, L tends to zero. So either we can look at it in terms of the set of parameters and compare to one or in terms of these uh, limits. So now we'll just directly give the summary of uh, the results of the analytical calculations. Okay. So we saw that the leading order divergent term in the entanglement entropy, uh, let's start first with the Dishley boundary condition. Uh, so when we switch from the small uh, level spacing to the large level spacing, then the form remains same, it's double log, but the parameters within this are uh, changed. Initially it, uh, it is AM and now it is N. So there is some change when we consider the Dirichlet boundary conditions. On the other hand, uh, for the normal and the periodic, when we move from the small level spacing to large level spacing, we see that uh, the nature of the divergent term changes from log log to log. And this is exactly what we were hunting for to begin with. We were trying to understand that why there is a change in the divergent nature. And we actually see that when we change the limits, the nature of the divergent term changes. So this is exactly the crossover that we were hunting for. And we indeed got that uh, signatures through this analytical treatment. So uh, finally, I can say that through this analytical uh, treatment, we have made explicit connections with the two different divergent behaviors, indicating that indeed there is a crossover. And as I already said, this crossover manifests itself as a change in the nature of the leading order divergent term for the ground state entanglement in the zero mode limit. As I already said, for the periodic in the normal, it is a change from log to log log. And for the Dirichlet, it is the parameters within the double log that are switched. Now, it is important to uh, understand that this uh, crossover is separate from uh, quantum criticality, which takes place at lambda equals to zero. It is not the same. So uh, now we move on to what is called as the ground state overlap function. We, we use this measure to capture the fundamental properties of the ground state wave function. Now this ground state overlap function is also called as uh, ground state fidelity. Now we actually also wanted to test uh, if the overlap function can see the crossover as an essential feature of the ground state uh, wave function because it tends to capture the fundamental properties uh, in the case of uh, one plus one dimension mass of scalar field. And also since we wanted to distinguish between the critical point and the crossover point, uh, we will now use the ground state overlap function. So in order to uh, mathematically use this, we can consider equation 10, where we make an infinitesimal change, delta lambda, in the value of the rescale mass. And then we just uh, take this dot product of the ground state wave function. Okay, so this is what we will consider. I'll show you the results here. Uh, where again, we have considered uh, the Dirichlet and the Norman boundary condition, DVC and DC respectively. Now, DVC, what happens is only in the limit n tending to infinity, it develops a zero mode. For finite n, it will not develop a zero mode. So what happens is actually for us, this function, it remains very close to unity. We cannot see it dropping down to zero, but we expect it to approach zero only in the end ending to infinity limit and, see, and since these are numerical calculations, however large we take uh, the number of oscillators, it will always be finite. So for DVC, it, is, it was very difficult for us to see if it's actually dropping into zero. So we can only have expectations there. But a neat result comes from the NBC, that is Norman boundary conditions, because here for finite end, it does develop a zero mode here. So we see that as lambda tends to zero, that is the zero mode limit, we see that this overlap function actually sharply dropping down to zero, okay? So this is a very uh, neat result as expected. So now after uh, analyzing the overlap function for the two boundary conditions, let's look at the signatures of the crossover. And for that, again, we will use zeta or the relative level uh, spacing uh, parameter that we had uh, seen previously. Now here uh, we see that for both Dirichlet and Norman, when zeta is much less than one, then this overlap function is determined by the oscillator system size n. We see that here it goes as n raised to the power four, n raised to the power four. On the other hand, when zeta is much greater than one, then this overlap function is determined by the rescale mass of the scalar field. 
So by looking at the overlap function in the two different limits, we again can capture the signatures of the crossover uh, when dealing with the Dirichlet or the Norman boundary condition. So we see here that uh, indeed the two different divergent behaviors initially that I mentioned, the log and the double log, that can be associated with a crossover and one can use the numerical pathway uh, by analyzing the entanglement spectrum in which case uh, when uh, we take lambda tends to zero on the zero mode limit the, the levels come close together or entanglement gap uh, yes hello yeah no no you, you have still five minutes you have still five minutes Okay, okay, thank you. Sir. Okay, yeah, so I'm just about to get this done. Okay, so, uh, yeah, so as I said, we can use the numerical recipe entanglement spectrum. I already mentioned entanglement gap, which in the zero mode limit uh, gap closes, or uses overlap function. Okay, so these are uh, measures that you can use to probe the crossover, or you can analyze the leading or the divergent term in the zero mode limit for the ground state entanglement. That's the analytical recipe for which the results I already mentioned. Okay, so both numerically and analytically, we have cross-check and uh, we can say for sure that there is a crossover in the zero mode limit for the ground state entanglement. Now, some important point, uh, points worthy of uh, mentioning here is that uh, the crossover marks a distinct onset of the zero mode effects. Most notably, the observers, develop, uh, they will develop a sensitivity to the system size, or you can say the IR cutoff, which then acts as an additional control parameter for the quantum entanglement or the fidelity, apart from the mass of the scalar field. And to summarize, we can say that yes, this crossover manifests itself as a noticeable shift in the leading or the divergent terms of entanglement and trophy, or in uh, the individual contributions to the fidelity function for an infinitesimal shift in the rescale mass. On the other hand, the zero mode effects will keep on amplifying as we progress towards the critical point. And here the entanglement entropy will start really diverging, the gap closes, the fidelity vanishes, marking the complete orthogonality of the states in and around lambda equals to zero. Now the critical and the crossover point, they converge only in the field theory limit, that is n tending to infinity at lambda equals to zero. And as initially mentioned, uh, however large, you take the system size, so long it is finite, we need to differentiate between the crossover point and the critical point. And for that precisely, we have used the ground state overlap function. And also because we have used the ground state overlap function, we can say, yes, the crossover is also a fundamental feature of the ground state wave function. So uh, indeed, we can uh, say that this crossover is not a very uh, trivial uh, result. It's a fundamental property. It's different from cr critical point, And it's a very interesting zone because then the IR effect and the system size effects uh, will start uh, marking its uh, presence when we take the zero mode limit. Okay. So this is the summary of the uh, work that we have done. Okay. So as a future scope, one can go ahead and uh, analyze this uh, case uh, in higher dimensions. We have already dealt with uh, one plus one dimension, okay? Or okay. we can do further analysis at the critical or the crossover point to analyze further about the IR dependence, as I mentioned, because then they will start really marking their presence and about other exotic features. Uh, that's it, uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We, have, we have time for one short okay. question. We have time for one short question. Yes. Yes. Okay, go ahead. Okay, go ahead. Okay, then we thanks. Uh, we thank uh, uh, Parul thanks, again. Uh, and we Parul switch again. to the next okay. speaker. We switch to uh, Angelo. Uh, Yes, I'm here. Thank you, sir. Yes, thank I'm you. Here. Yes, I see you. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay. We can see your uh, screen. Okay. Okay. Can I start now? Okay, you can start. Fine, Angelo. Thank you. 
Uh, so uh, I'm going to communicate a very initial uh, proposal. Uh, this is some summary of of the topic. So I I I pretend to give some idea of of the steps of this proposal. So we have uh, two main uh, implementations. The first one is uh, what I'm calling spinor representation of representation. And the second step is the effective metric, uh, which contains the spinor of uh, gravity. Then we have some uh, solutions to different uh, static and spherical symmetric solutions. Um, an initial uh, implementation of how can we uh, define gravitational waves in this framework and how these uh, uh, spinors uh, uh, are interacting with matter. Uh, basically, um, we have uh, three main principles in general relativity. Uh, the first one is more related to the uh, logical consistency of the theory. Actually, even uh, special relativity uh, uh, is covariant. Uh, so this is uh, in terms of the structure of general relativity, general covariance is uh, more mathematical. And the physical principle actually is the uh, equivalence principle. But there is another uh, additional or ad hoc hypothesis, which is uh, the, the association between the metric and the gravitational field. So basically, uh, uh, it is assumed that the metric uh, has an intrinsic dynamics, which is described by nonlinear differential equations. Uh, in an equivalent way, the Einstein equations are totally arbitrary and independent from the first two principles. And uh, this uh, is exactly the the point uh, where we are going to modify. Uh, just to mention briefly, uh, there are four directions uh, in the physics of the last century, which uh, in certain sense are connected, but uh, not directly. The first one is the Einstein Cartan theory, uh, which was shown by Kibble that the torsion, uh, when we introduce the torsion uh, in general relativity, as was done by Cartan, uh, this torsion is responsible for induce a, a four fermion coupling in the Dirac uh, equation. So we have Dirac equation plus. Uh, self-interaction. Uh, this is uh, to say a, a modification of the external uh, connection. Instead of only have a, a crystal symbol in general relativity, we have an unsymmetric uh, connection. And this is uh, assumed to be the correct uh, coupling between fermionic matter and uh, gravity in the general relativity. Uh, the, the second uh, direction is actually the neutrino physics uh, at the beginning uh, in a more general way the weak interactions. Uh, this is still open because we don't know exactly the nature of the what is called sterile neutrinos, which is uh, 
the outside sector of the standard model. Uh, then there is a third one, uh, uh, which I should, uh, I would like to comment, which is the Heisenberg program for a nonlinear spinner field of uh, field, uh, spinner field theory. Uh, this Lagrangian uh, actually is in, Minko in Minkowski. And the first part is just a uh, 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 Dirac equation. Uh, actually, here there is no this mass term. Uh, this mass term is zero. And there is this uh, self coupling, which is the four frame coupling. But for Heisenberg, this Lagrangian does not represent uh, a Lagrangian for a specific matter field. Instead, it is responsible for generating uh, the fundamental equations for all types of matter. So this psi here uh, uh, does not correspond to a one specific uh, matter field, but it is responsible for generating all kinds of, of matter. Uh, this program has uh, so, uh, another point, uh, key point here is this L. This scale, scale factor for Heisenberg is, uh, could be indicating a new, uh, a new scale for physics, uh, and it is universal. Uh, okay, the last uh, direction I, I would like to comment is the Sakharov conjecture. Uh, I am saying a more uh, bigger view. Actually, for Sakharov, uh, gravitation could be uh, thought as quantum fluctuation of matter fields. And actually, it is, uh, is the seed for uh, proposals like induced gravity, pre geometry, composite metrics, uh, effective geometries, and more recently, analog gravity. Um, this is uh, all these four uh, directions are related in some, in a certain sense, to our proposal. So basically, uh, uh, the first problem is uh, concerning on the intrinsic uh, dynamical metric in, in general relativity, which is not unique. So uh, as a question we could state, uh, is the metric uh, the only way to implement the equivalence principle? And our proposal here is to say no, there is another way to represent the equivalence principle, uh, which is by uh, spinors fields like uh, Heisenberg. Uh, but instead of thinking in matter fields, we are proposing that these self-interacting uh, spinors are representing uh, gravity in the Minkowski space. And the second step is uh, actually an implementation which responds to this pro problem 1.b is the relation, uh, which is uh, the relation between gra gra gravity and the weak interactions, um, as we, we will see. So, uh, in a more uh, in some detail here, all we have to start is a spinor field uh, in Clifford algebra. Uh, the internal elements of the Clifford algebra are related to the external Minkowski work by the anti-commutator of the gamma fields, gamma matrices. And uh, oh, this Minkowski uh, metric is in arbitrary coordinates. So in order to satisfy um, its pseudo-Riemannian condition, its covariant derivative, 
uh, implies that the covariant derivative uh, of the gamma matrix uh, can be null. And this is how Fock and uh, Ivanenko derived the, what is called the internal connection, which is given by the spectrum form. Uh, but this actually is not uh, unique. Uh, the fact that uh, the Minkowski method is satisfying the pseudo Riemannian condition does not imply uh, necessarily that the uh, covariant derivative of the gammas must be zero. Actually, we could uh, express this covariant derivative as an anti-commutator of uh, a four vector U with the gammas. And this give, gives, uh, this introduces a more general uh, internal connection. So that's why I was uh, commenting on, on einstein cartan theory, because here, actually, our uh, modification is inciting over the internal connection instead of the external Christopher connection. Uh, so the first thing, uh, having flat coordinates, there is an internal connection here presenting this uh, Clifford algebra. This is the action, uh, which is uh, simply the Dirac action uh, with this new covariant derivative, uh, which gives this system of equations. And here there are some particular cases, as I just said, even in flat coordinates, there is an internal connection uh, uh, which uh, is given in terms of the, the new uh, four-vector introduced, uh, stating uh, the four-vector as uh, real, and we can express uh, in terms of a scalar field, which satisfies uh, Klein-Gordon field uh, equation. And this is the a sort of direct uh, uh, equation couplet to this scalar field. And the third particular case, uh, which is relevant to our implementation, is the uh, vector plus or, or minus axial current, which was introduced by Sudarshan Masha in the 50s, late 50s. Uh, and here what we have is the equation F, uh, 14 plus the self-interaction of the spinor of gravity, just as Heisenberg was implemented. Uh, the second step is the hypothesis that uh, the metric uh, which describes the, the curved space uh, actually is an effective metric uh, which is defined by this uh, delta nu vectors. They are nu uh, given the properties of the four vector uh, Current and the axial current, uh, and the K property here is the expression twenty one. There are two uh, relevant properties. The uh, the first is the fact that uh, these vectors are null vectors, uh, and the second uh, this led to a sort of closer relation because. Uh, as you know, uh, when we do this function, this is exact, this is not an expansion. But when we calculate the contravariant metric of the, the 16, the covariant metric, what we have is an infinite series. 
but uh, given the property in editing, we have an exact uh, form for the uh, inverse. And consequently, the determinant of this metric uh, reduces to the determinant of the Minkowski uh, background. So the first solution, uh, we are considering uh, only the scalar field uh, without self-interaction. We and what happens is that this uh, scalar field uh, is responsible for uh, the coup, the coup, the radial uh, dependence from the angular dependence. So, consequently, what we have is just a spinor uh, solution with a radial function. And uh, this corresponds to uh, led, led, led to the equation 27. And which under a coordinate transformation is just the solution uh, found by Schwarzschild. Instead, when um, consider the self-interaction of the spinor field, uh, we obtain this system of equations, uh, which is reduced to the uh, equation third one. And considering uh, this uh, lambda here, which is uh, a combination of uh, containing the, the, the length uh, of the the coupling, uh, the coupling constant of the self-interaction, uh, we obtain a function depending on the self-interaction, which of course, when lambda goes to zero, we obtain the first solution. And again, this, this uh, solution uh, reduces to a uh, type of uh, Schwarzschild uh, line element, uh, but with this new horizon here. So the horizon is modified by the self-interaction coupling constant. And Marcelo, you have, can... Marcelo, you have three minutes. Okay, thank you. Uh, so basically, this is the the main outcome of the the second solution, which we are still analyzing. And uh, of course, since we have a metric which is not dynamical, uh, this metric is effective in the sense that uh, it does not have its own dynamics. We don't have here Einstein equations. What we have are the, uh, the equation for the spinor field. So the theory of uh, cosmological perturbations does not apply to this framework. And we need to look uh, for uh, a new uh, definition of gravitational waves. What we find is that when the spinor uh, of gravity has this sort of solution, we obtain with very natural conditions uh, that the effective geometry is rich flat. And in this, uh, uh, under these conditions, we obtain a definition uh, of, of gravitational waves, which corresponds to the Kunt uh, plane fronted waves in general relativity. Here is some sketch of the uh, role of the new uh, four vector. Uh, I, I did not introduce it here, but there is, uh, of course, we, we obtain a Friedman uh, scenario 
uh, em isotropic and homogeneous, homogeneous uh, symmetry uh, with only the scalar field. Uh, what about the coupling with universal coupling with matter? Uh, well, what we can show is that uh, we can define in the exactly the same way the energy momentum tensor as in general relativity. Uh, this is uh, directly uh, found from the coupling with, for instance, scalar fields. And uh, the expression 38 is the is the uh, the fundamental equation for the spin or gravity uh, coupled to, to, to all forms of matter, where this quantity here is containing the self-interacting term. This is, uh, as I said, the coupling with uh, the scalar field and uh, in the, uh, the variation shows explicitly that uh, it reduces to a Klein-Gordon uh, equation because uh, the variation of the determinant of the effective match vanishes since it reduces to the uh, Minkowski background. Uh, uh, just a comment about the electromagnetic field. We have uh, exactly the standard approach, just to mention that when we apply Hadamard's continuities uh, to the equation 45, we found that uh, the electromagnetic field follows geodesics uh, when it satisfies uh, when the, the metric the, is is orthogonal to the surface of this continuity. And finally, about the fermionic field, uh, I'm concluding. Conclusion. So I'm concluding. Yeah, okay. About the fermionic field, what is uh, very interesting is that given the properties of this effective metric, uh, the fermionic field does not see the effective metric. And this is a very nice outcome because actually here we have a sort of internal equivalence principle. We dislocated the equivalence principle to the Clifford algebra. Uh, okay, this is my presentation. This is uh, just to mention the full uh, framework with two spinor fields instead of having only uh, the current for the psi, we have the uh, omega spinor field with these respective currents, and this is the corresponding uh, effective metric. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Very nice. Thank you for presenting, uh, Angelo. Um, we, uh, after the uh, talks, we can uh, ask questions when we construct a uh, breakout room. Uh, next, uh, I introduce Bado Lampe uh, and talk about from neutrino masses to the full size of the universe. Can you hear me? Yes, can you hear me also? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, you can share your screen. Yes. <clears throat> okay, uh, I, it does not work. You not see yet. Uh, under the green. Yes, uh, I, uh, I have it. Okay. Yes. Okay. C can you see it? Yes. Okay, that, yes. then I start. Okay. I want to talk about some implications of the Tetron model of particle physics and cosmology. 
In this model, the universe itself is an elastic medium composed of invisible constituents which are bound at Planck energy. While the laws of gravity are due to the elastic properties of the medium, particle physics interactions take place within internal fibers with the characteristic internal energy being the Fermi scale. All ordinary metaquarks and leptons are constructed as eigenmode excitations of this internal fiber structure. Now in my talk, I want to explain some details of this statement. In the Tetra model, the ground state of our universe looks like this. The large horizontal arrow here stands for the three dimensions of physical space, while the tetrahedrons here extend into three additional internal dimensions. The picture is a little misleading because in the tetron model physical space and internal dimensions are assumed to be completely orthogonal. This means the whole game is actually played within a large, altogether six dimensional space, three physical dimensions and three internal ones. If you ask why this structure, I can say at this point that the tetrahedral structure is introduced in order to explain the observed quark and lepton spectrum, which means to get exactly 24 excitation states with the correct multiplet structure. Before discussing the excitations, let us first consider the ground state in some more detail. As you can see here, each tetrahedron is made up from four constituents called tetrons depicted as the white dots. The white arrows denote the isospins or internal spin vectors of the tetrons. This means the tetrons have a spin in physical space and in addition, an internal space, an internal spin in internal space. And actually the interactions of the internal spins play an important role for particle physics and for electroweak symmetry breaking. Namely in this picture, the symmetry breaking has already taken place because the isospins are aligned in all the tetrahedrons. Look for example at this and this and this vectors and these three vectors are aligned. Before the symmetry breaking, which means above a certain temperature, isospins are distributed randomly. They are not aligned, and uh, this corresponds to a local SU2 symmetry. But when the universe cools down, there is a phase transition, and the isospins freeze into the aligned tetrahedral structure. And the important point to note is that it turns out that this temperature uh, can be identified with the Fermi scale. How does this work out in detail? Mathematically, Tetron is assumed to transform as the fundamental spin or representation of SO61. Because you have six spatial dimensions three physical ones and three internal ones. Now the fundamental spin representation of SO61 is eight dimensional and sometimes called the octonion representation. 
with respect to the decomposition of SO61 into the three-dimensional base space and the three-dimensional internal space, a tetron possesses spin one half and isospin one half. This means it can rotate both in physical space and in internal space and corresponds to the fact that a tetron decomposes into an isospin doublet of two ordinary SO31 Dirac fields. So the octonion representation decomposes into two Dirac fields. Using this, one can now rigorously define the isospin vectors, which uh, have been used and drawn in the figure. So these vectors are defined uh, using this formula here, where tau are the internal spin power matrices. The typical interaction Hamiltonian between uh, such isospin vectors of two tetrons, i and j, looks like this. So it has the form of a Heisenberg interaction, but for isospins, not for spins. A Hamiltonian of this kind is assumed to be responsible both for the alignment of the tetrahedrons as well as for the electroweak symmetry breaking. And furthermore, it allows to calculate the quark and lepton masses. I refer here to the following review. And in this review, you will find all the details, how to construct the electroweak order parameter, the Higgs field, and how to calculate the particle masses. At this point, it must be enough to say that among the 24 isospin excitations, there are three almost massless modes. Among the 24 isospin excitations, uh, which are the quarks and leptons, there are three almost massless modes, which correspond to the neutrinos. And that this has to do with the conservation of total isospin. This is written down here. Uh, so sigma is the total internal angular momentum and the conservation equation for the three components of sigma leads directly to three of the 24 eigenmodes being massless. So this is all for particle physics. From this point on, I do not want to give more details on this, uh, but want to concentrate on gravity and cosmological aspects. In order to include gravity in the tetron model, it is assumed that there is not only an interaction among the isospin vectors in internal space, but also a binding among any two neighboring tetrahedrons in physical space and that this binding is elastic. In other words, our universe is a three-dimensional elastic medium expanding within some larger six-dimensional space, and it can acquire curvature both in space and time. For the uh, three-dimensional physical space, the expansion looks as follows. Note that in physical space, the tetrahedrons are point-like because they extend into the internal dimensions only. This means you do not see the tetrahedral structure. You only see points which are bound with bond lengths about the Planck's length and binding energy, the Planck energy. In the beginning, uh, I should say, uh, before the expansion started, 
the universe was created in a sudden, so to say, inflationary condensation process from an ultra hot tetron gas, and afterwards was, was it was pushed to expansion by the uh, condensation energy. In the next step, I want to draw a connection between the smallest and the largest scales of the universe. Namely, between the tetron binding structure at Planck length and the size of the universe as a whole. For that purpose, let us consider the binding energy of two tetrahedrons as a function of the bond length L. So this means the binding energy of uh, two dots in the figure as a function of their distance. It is assumed that this function has a minimum at some bond length Ls, and that at present we are at bond length L0, roughly equal to the Planck length. So the function looks like this. It has a minimum at Ls. From this figure, one concludes that the universe is expanding towards an equilibrium corresponding to an average bond length Ls. So the whole universe is carrying out an extremely low frequency bracing vibration around Ls, and all the tetron bonds on average are vibrating in accord with the universe. One can work out the details of this picture and indeed show that this effect accounts for the present accelerated expansion as given by the dark energy observations. This has been done in this reference. An important point to note here is that in future, more precise dark energy measurements may allow to extract the bracing frequency omega of the universe. And from this frequency, one can then calculate the full size diameter d of the universe according to this simple formula. So this is all I wanted to say today. Thank you for your attention. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you <clears throat> for the presentation. Okay. Uh, are there questions? That's a very interesting um, uh, presentation. Thank you for your um, for your presentation. Um, we now we want to do the presentation of Alessio. Is Alessio there? Yes, here I am. Okay. You can start your presentation, Alessio. Uh, now it says that it is impossible unless <clears throat> the other participants uh, is sharing the screen. Uh, I think I have to go out. Or, uh... Yeah, you have to, to uh, un. <clears throat> to end uh, screen, yeah. To end to end uh, use your screen, yeah. Okay. 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 Thank you, Alessio. Okay. Perfect. Yeah, I see your screen. Mm -hmm. Very fine. Okay, so thank you for the invitation. Um, this workshop, uh, this presentation is about the quantum communication in models involving accelerating semi-transparent mirrors. And the main topic of that is the relativistic quantum information, which is a science trying to match up uh, the effects arising from quantum field theory in good space time with the uh, quantum information theory. The aim is to find out if uh, the um, these effects uh, arising from quantum field theory in course space time could increase or decrease the communication capabilities of 
quantum relativistic devices, in this case, mirror. So, uh, what is quantum field theory in cost space time? Well, as the name suggests, it is like quantum field theory, but a generic background metric instead of the Minkowski one is considered. And since uh, even uh, curved backgrounds could be considered, this provides a first approximation to quantum gravity. The astonishing result uh, of this theory is that if the background metric evolves in time, then a radiation of particles from vacuum occurs. And this has a lot of uh, interesting and famous applications, such that the Uru effect, saying that an accelerating detector undergoes a particle radiation. The most famous of all, the Oki radiation, saying that a star collapsing into a black hole creates a steady flux of energy, which is radiated even once the black hole is formed. Last but not least, the dynamical Casimir effect, which was experimentally proved. And basically, it is the radiation by accelerating mirrors. Now, let's focus about the latter. Um, how this works? Well, uh, the mirrors are in general considered in a one plus one dimensional space time. And each mirror provides a boundary condition to the modes. A perfect reflecting mirror, for example, imposes the condition that each wave function should be zero in correspondence of the position of the mirror. Now, if this boundary condition moves and changes in time, one expects a difference between the input and output space-time structure. And hence, one expects a particle production to occur. Mm, now, in general, the particle production by moving mirror will be obtained studying the so-called Bogolub of coefficients of the systems. These are complex numbers uh, that relate the input modes with the output modes, namely the modes in the initial space-time with the modes in the final space-time, and they could be obtained trivially uh, for a scalar product between them. The Bogolub of coefficients are very important because they identify completely the spectrum of particles produced by uh, the mirrors with this integral in particular. Beside the dynamical Casimir effect, another great utility of moving mirrors is that mm, the radiation by moving mirrors simulates OK radiation in the following aspects, such as the number of particles radiated per unit time, the total number of particles produced, and the flux of energy. By this, the mirror could be considered as a black hole analogous, and one could study black hole properties for accelerating mirrors. Now, the first aim of my research was to uh, extend the mirror model, including semi-transparency. So considering semi-transparent mirrors. Uh, why should we do that? Well, first of all, uh, a more realistic case for the dynamical Casimir effect is provided, because uh, we know that perfect reflection is only an approximation, while uh, for each, we know that each real mirror is transparent for uh, high frequencies. Then, in the black hole mirror analogy, uh, for several mathematical reasons, if we associate the reflection of the mirror with the center of the collapsing ball, the analogy then fails when one considers coordinates with a space-like singularity, such as the Eddington Filkestein coordinates. Instead, uh, as I said, for uh, several and complicated mathematical reasons, including semi-transparency, one could provide an analogy even in this kind of coordinates. Lastly, uh, mm, I firmly believe that with the semi-transparency, one could emulate the backscattering and mm, other absorption effects of Hawking radiation. And uh, I would like to prove that in uh, future works. So to, ex to consider the semi-transparency, I started with the following Lagrangian density, which is a Lagrangian density of a um, massless scalar field interacting with a delta-like potential of strength alpha. This is for a static semi-transparent mirror. And with that, uh, I have obtained the following amplitudes for the reflection and the transmission. Now, the problem is that uh, these amplitudes are valid for uh, the mirrors at rest. But when the mirror accelerates, uh, this uh, amplitude becomes time-dependent because they, because they depend on the, on the velocity that the mirror has at a certain time. This is a great mathematical complication because also the boundary condition between the left and the right of the mirror changes in time. So to avoid this problem, I have used the following method. Namely, I've considered the modes initially in the mirror frame in proper coordinates, simply because in this frame, uh, trivially, the mirror is at rest. And then I have passed to the external coordinates through another volume of transformation. And using this strategy, I have obtained the following general expressions for the Bogolyubov coefficients for uh, semi-transparent accelerating mirror. 
the trajectory of the mirror is uh, defined by the functions overline u of u prime and overline v of v prime. These are functions mapping the uh, null external coordinates to the null proper coordinates, and they obviously depend on the trajectory of the mirror. So we can see now that these expressions for the volume of coefficients are really harsh to compute, and for now, uh, there is not a, a trajectory, a valid trajectory for the mirror, uh, which uh, lead to an analytic expression for them. So to obtain a simple, ex uh, simpler expression and uh, an analytic solution, I have considered the following class of trajectories for the mirror, namely the impulsive accelerating mirrors. We have mirrors initially at rest, as shown in this figure, that impulsively accelerate toward the left in a really short period of time, named U0. And after this short period of time, uh, the mirror continues to travel uh, at an inertial speed v of f, which could be also represented for simplicity by this parameter nu. In the figure at the right, uh, we got the plot of the particles produced by impulsive accelerating mirror for different values of the final speed of the mirror. And as uh, we expected, the more is the final speed of the mirror, the more is the acceleration during the short acceleration period, and hence the more is the particle production. One could also prove analytically that and find the limit of this spectrum for nu going to plus infinity, hence for the final speed of the mirror really close to the speed of light. With that, I have obtained the following analytic uh, solution for the spectrum of particles produced, which provides an upper bound of the spectrum uh, produced by the impulsive accelerated mirror. Okay, the second aim of my research now is to study the transmission of an input signal with frequency omega incoming from the left of the mirror and not going to the right. To do that, and to consider the uh, quantum effects, I'll show the dynamical Casimir effect into that, I have used uh, quantum information theory with continuous variable systems. In particular, I have considered the input signal as a one-mode Gaussian state and the mirror itself as a one-mode Gaussian channel. Now, uh, for uh, quantum information theory, by quantum information theory, the entropic quantities of a one-mode Gaussian state are in general related to its covariance matrix. For the input, the covariance matrix is the following, where the quadrature operators, Q and P, are dependent on the uh, bosonic operator, so the creation and annihilation operator of the input, of the input incoming from the left. For the output, one has exactly the same thing, but this time, instead of uh, the boson operators of the input AL, one should consider the bosonic operator of the output. And uh, the, we know that the bosonic operator of the output is the, are, um, are dependent by the input ones for the following Bogoliub of transformation. Then, um, after uh, under one mode Gaussian channel, the covariance matrix of the input evolves in this exact way. So uh, one could uh, calculate the components of sigma in and sigma out, and with that, with this equation, uh, find the components of uh, the matrices T and N. Then, uh, from a study by Alexander Olivo, the average attenuation amplification could be studied for, with the determinant of T, of the matrix T. Instead, the average number of noisy particles, so the average additive noise, will be studied with the determinant of n with the following equation. So using this strategy, I have obtained the following uh, general expressions for the average attenuation or amplification, if tau is greater than one, and the average additive noise produced by uh, accelerating mirrors. This is an average in time, obviously. The interesting thing to know and notice about these expressions is that they are both related only on the Bogoliub of coefficients. So uh, this means that with the Bogoliub of coefficients, uh, we could obtain information not only on uh, the particle production, but also on the communication properties of mirrors. And uh, this also means that um, uh, we have succeeded to include all the uh, effects arising from quantum filtering or space time in the quantum communication framework. Now, uh, let's go uh, forward to the particular solution of tau and overline n for impulsive accelerated mirrors. We have no additive noise in that case. And uh, for uh, tau, we have that tau is always less than one. 
Hence, tau is basically a modified transmission coefficient. Nevertheless, tau, uh, the transmission coefficient of impulsive accelerated mirror, if uh, the mirror has a final speed different than zero, is always greater with respect to the static case. However, a really interesting thing uh, studying, arising studying tau is that tau is maximized not when the final speed of the mirror uh, becomes close to the speed of light, but when it reaches a particular speed, which is named critical velocity. Namely, for each input frequency omega, there is a critical final velocity of the mirror that maximizes the transmission tau. And uh, this critical velocity is dependent on the input frequency, and it is given by the following analytic expression. In particular, for low frequencies, the critical velocity becomes uh, asymptotic to the speed of light, while for high frequencies, uh, the critical velocity is asymptotic to the particular value 0 0.8 times the speed of light, since we are in uh, natural units. That is named high frequency critical speed. Here is a plot of the transmission coefficients for three particular cases. Uh, the static case, we equal to one, so a static semi transfer mirror. We equal to 10, which is uh, an impulsive accelerated mirror with a final speed close to the high frequency critical speed. And we equal to 1000, which is an impulsive accelerated mirror with a final speed really, really close to the speed of light. Because of the presence of the critical velocity, we have dif uh, different behavior and uh, techniques of optimization of the transmission coefficient. Namely, uh, for low frequencies, it is more convenient to accelerate the mirror at a speed as close as possible to the speed of light. While for high frequencies, it is more convenient to accelerate the mirror until this particular speed, 0 0.8, and not to overcome it. Now, since uh, we have seen that uh, for impulsive accelerated mirrors, the additive noise is zero. The calculation of the capacities is straightforward since the channel is a bit split. Um, the capacity basically is uh, the maximum rate of information that the mirror could transmit reliably. Then we talk about classical capacity when we refer to the transmission of classical information. While we talk about quantum capacity when we refer about when we refer on the transmission of uh, quantum information. From these plots, we can see that to transmit better classical information, it is more convenient to accelerate the mirror to a speed as close as possible to the speed of light, since here uh, the curve nu equal to 1000, the, um, the peak is higher. Instead, to transmit better quantum information, it is more convenient to accelerate the mirror to a speed comparable to the high frequency critical speed, since in this range, nu equal to 10 is higher. So now, concluding and resuming the results, um, I have found a general expression for the Bogolyubov coefficients for semi transparent moving mirrors. Then it was proved that the transmission and noise generation properties of accelerated mirror can be expressed for the Bogolyubov coefficients as well as the particle production. In particular, then I have uh, computed uh, and studied the particle production, transmission, and noise generation for impulsive accelerated mirrors, namely for uh, mirrors with a strong acceleration in a short time period. Lastly, evaluating the capacities, mm. I obtained that mm, to maximize the transmission of classical information, it is more convenient to accelerate a mirror to a speed as, as close as possible to the speed of light. Instead, for the quantum capacity, we should not overcome uh, a particular a particular speed which is 0 0.8 we should stop there now uh, future goals after this work and uh, outlooks we led to the study of the same problem but considering wave packets instead of monochromatic waves in that case um, through the Heisenberg principle Mm, we include also the time dependence to this problem. Then uh, I would like to research a trajectory providing an analytic solution for the bogle of coefficients of semi-transparent accelerated mirrors. And this was not yet done, even if um, it is uh, nearly impossible for now. Lastly, as I said before, I would like to um, find the analogy between semi-transparent mirrors and black holes. In particular, I would like to associate the semi-transparency to uh, the absorption or backscattering effects of open radiation. So thank you for the attention. Okay.
<coughs> thank you for your presentation, Lesio. Uh, we have some time for questions. Uh, I have a question, Alessio. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Uh, is there possible a connection of your mirror system with the uh, horizon of the black hole? Could you apply this to describe the um, uh, evaluation of the horizon in a time-dependent setting? Uh, the what of the horizon, sorry? Now, could you Elaborate. apply? Could you apply mm -hmm. the acceleration of your mirror with mm -hmm. the, for example, the horizon or the uh, firewall in uh, mm -hmm. in black hole physics? Well, I, I hope to do that. Uh, in fact, mm, when there is uh, an optimal radiation in general. Um, there was uh, always a sort of uh, bed scattering. So sort of firewall. So I hope uh, sincerely to find, relate the transmission coefficient of these mirrors to the cross section of uh, Hawking radiation to these um, to these uh, walls. I hope to yes. do that. Yeah, because, be the Hawking, and to, yeah. Mm -hmm. because the Hawking radiation will be mm -hmm. produced uh, uh, close to the horizon. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, yeah uh, but in general, I didn't follow the interpretation of Hawking of how the particles are generated. I have followed the, the, um, the mathematical calculation I think by quantum field theory in space time, so the original calculations by Hawking. Uh, mm -hmm. Then I have not considered the creation uh, on the event horizon because uh, this was an inter for what I know, this was an interpretation given later uh, in order to explain uh, how it is possible that some particles could escape from uh, the event horizon. Okay. And how okay. the black hole could evaporate. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and maybe the uh, to make the difference between the uh, the local, the ingoing uh, uh, observer and the outside, what, what, what will they uh, observe? Uh, that is also uh, interesting in connection with your model maybe. Mm -hmm, exactly. Um, okay. Next step. Uh, next step about the quantum communication framework of this work was, uh, is will be to relate the um, the communication of these mirrors uh, from the communication between the inner and uh, uh, the. Uh, yeah. <laughs> this, uh, this is really ambitious uh, as a thing, but. Yeah. Uh, Maybe I should correct the mirror model in such a way that they can emulate better um, an event horizon. For example, I was thinking about adding another mirror behind the one I've built to absorb uh, each, each incoming radiation or something mm. like that. Yeah, yeah, indeed, that you, uh, that you don't need the, uh, the, the R is zero singularity because that is mm. a problem in uh, quantum gravity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in fact. Okay, uh, well, thank you again. Um, and uh, to all the speakers, you get information uh, about the, uh, the uh, proceedings. Yeah? You can send to me uh, your contribution, but uh, see on the site, for the uh, time you have. There are some months uh, time to, to, to uh, prepare your uh, uh, contribution for the, uh, for the proceedings. Okay? And uh, it would be fine if all of you send 